Okay. Hey, uh, in this video, we are going to look now how to prepare samples that are liquids, and more precisely, we are going to dig into um, liquid liquid extraction. So, liquids, what are the um, uh, kinds of sample preparations that can be used? We are more going to be exclusively looking at extraction techniques here. Solid phase extraction, liquid liquid extraction. Liquid liquid extraction is actually something that you potentially have done before. And um, so solid phase extraction is something that is, um, it has become very popular over the last um, 20, 15 years. And um, it is now, exclude very to a very very large extent a large extent has um substituted liquid liquid extraction in, in the extraction landscape uh, but in addition to solid phase extraction liquid liquid extraction also concentrating and diluting samples is still a very important technique in the sample preparation for liquid samples with dilution this is mostly for samples that are too concentrated so that we need to do dilution first to bring the analyte concentration into the dynamic, even better linear, linear range of the methods that we are using. Uh, also in case of chromatography, we could, uh, the concentrations can be too high to, that could overload the column. So make our peaks in the chromatogram tail lot. So, this is something that we also can avoid by diluting the sample to a reasonable concentration range. However, a lot of samples, especially as the limits that we are needing to detect due to legislation purposes, for example, are decreasing constantly. The concentrations that we need to imply concentration uh, concentrating the samples more and more. So concentrating the sample is very important. And um, the classical concentrating of the samples is doing by uh, reducing the volume of the liquid sample, for example, by slightly heating the sample and allowing the solvent to evaporate. And this is actually still very much done. It can be done on its own or in combination with extraction as a step after the extraction, for example. And uh, very often a slight stream of, a, uh, of an inert gas or air is used to essentially flush off the solvent vapor from the, um, from the upper layer on top of the liquid sample. So this kind of speeds up the evaporation of the solvent by constantly removing um, the solvent vapor uh, from the surface of the, between the uh, liquid and the air. Uh, and this is this is is one of the most common ways to concentrate samples. It's very very often uh, applied after liquid liquid extraction or solid phase extraction to concentrate the sample, the extracts that come from these extraction techniques. Uh, it can also be that the vacuum is used to concentrate the sample. Uh, it's not maybe so convenient, uh, but still also possible. What is important if we do the uh, heating of the sample is so that the sample would not start boiling because then we can also lost our analyte, which might either you know, then just get out from the sample with the, with the droplets that um, are created during the boiling. Also too high temperatures should of course be avoided to avoid degradation of the, of the analyte. Um, so because some of the compounds that we are analyzing can be temperature dependent, especially in case of uh, transformation products, uh, for example, pesticide transformation products in either environmental uh, water or um, food samples, uh, they are very sensitive to temperatures. The same for pharmaceutical residues, they uh, and pharmaceutical metabolites, they can be very sensitive to temperatures. So uh, using too high temperatures to remove solvent definitely needs to be um, needs to be avoided. 
But now when we dig into the extractions, then the classical way of extracting liquid samples is with a liquid-liquid extraction. And the definition of the extraction actually is uh, very much uh, the heart of liquid-liquid extraction. And extraction, is, as extraction, we understand the processes, chemical, phys physical, chemical methods that contribute to separating the compounds uh, from mixtures or from solutions. And the liquid-liquid extraction is based on compounds' different solubility in different solvents. So this means that the compounds prefer one of the solvents to another, and we can use that to, uh, to transfer some of the compounds to one solvent while the other compounds stay in the other solvent. This, for example, is when we want to remove interfering compounds. So we could use a solvent um, which our analytes prefer to extract with this solvent our sample, uh, while the interfering compounds preferentially stay in the original sample, uh, solvent of the sample, or vice versa. Also, we can use this to concentrate the sample by simply using a smaller volume of the preferred solvent and extract our analytes to this smaller volume. Or sometimes we also just want to change the solvent because the solvent is not suitable for the analysis that we want to perform. For example, if we want to do uh, gas chromatography with um, samples which originally are in water. Or if we want to do IR measurements with samples which originally are in water, again, we would need to get rid of the water, which is our natural matrix. So we need to do some kind of a sample preparation here. And liquid-liquid extraction uh, is here one of the very efficient potential methods. Um, Liquid-liquid extraction is based on partitioning of the analyte. Here we denote it on the scheme with an A between uh, different phases. Most often, one of the phases is a water phase, and the other phase is an organic uh, solvent. This could be whatever solvent which is not mixable with the water, uh, which means that we could actually get two separate layers of the solvent. And this uh, partitioning of this compound A can be described with the partitioning coefficient Kd which is the ratio of the concentration of the analyte, uh, in our case defined as the concentration ratio of the analyte in the organic solvent A divided by the concentration of the same compound in the water phase. And this is something that is specific to the compound and to these two solvents. So whenever we, we are extracting this compound from water to the same organic solvent, then this Kd stays the same. And this comes from the different solubility of this compound in these two different solvents. So the larger the Kd is, the more our compound A prefers the organic phase. So this means also that we can extract with a small portion of the uh, organic solvent this compound A to this organic solvent. Uh, the amount of analyte that is extracted with the specific um, volume of the organic solvent uh, can be calculated based on this equation E here. Uh, what we generally see from here is that the larger the Kd, the closer the E is to 1. So that means that the uh, amount of analyte is becoming higher. Also, the more organic the more organic solvent in volume we have, again, the closer this extractive portion becomes to one. So that means, again, the more we are extracting this compound A to our organic modifier, organic solvent. So one of the comp comp important questions is uh, how much organic solvent I should use to extract the compound from this water phase efficiently so that I would have a high recovery. And another question is how, of, how many times should I repeat this? Uh, 
so actually this equation from the previous slide can help us to uh, answer this question. And I would actually like to ask you to do this math through yourself. Um, but the general answer is that if we have a compound and we have 100 milliliters of the water phase, which is our sample, which we're trying to extract the analyte out of, with a concentration, let's say arbitrarily, it's one unit of whatever unit, and the partial coefficient of this analyte um, between the organic and the water phase uh, is five. This means that the concentration in the organic phase is five times higher than in the water phase. So this ratio here is five. Then we can play the game that we extract this 100 milliliters of the water phase with another 100 milliliters of the organic solvent. And we would see that 17% of the analyte A would stay in the water phase when we do this extraction once. But we, what we could also do is that we divide this organic solvent up into two parts, into two 50 milliliter parts. And then only 8% of the analyte would remain uh, in the water phase, which means that our recovery would be increase from 83% to 92%, assuming no other sources of, of loss here. And if we would actually extract four times with 25 milliliters, then we would even get a higher recovery of 96% for this extraction. This means, and this is actually universal, meaning that always it's smarter to extract multiple times with smaller volumes. And I suggest that you do this math through yourself also so that you can, you can see how this actually works. And so always we want to use a solvent that has a high KD for our analyte. So our analyte is preferring, preferring this solvent very strongly over the original solvent that the analyte is in. And uh, we would like to extract multiple times with smaller volumes. Generally, if we deal with low concentration samples, we would also generally like to extract with ha as uh, low volumes of the extracting solvent as possible. For example, here, if we would extract it all together with 100 milliliters of the organic solvent, then what happens is that in the end, we still have 100 milliliters of the extract as we had 100 milliliters of the, of the samples in, sample in the beginning, which means that we haven't really concentrated the sample. Though we could have, uh, maybe it was also important for us to change the solvent, or maybe it was important that to get rid of the interferences. So these are still the things that we could have achieved. But preferentially, we also very often want to do concentrating of the sample here. So this is also something um, what we need to keep in mind. In reality, what we do is that we often really optimize the method by a very rigid optimization, um, optimization procedure, which means that we test different organic solvents for the extraction, as well as we test different volumes that we need to use, and also different uh, times of uh, extraction. So how many times do we repeat this extraction procedure uh, so that we'll get an optimal recovery here? Uh, how to choose the solvent? Um, also, it's, um, if, as I told, the actual um, choice is based on the actual optimization experiment. Usually we test the number of the solvents, uh, but how to maybe start with this choice of this, of the selection of these solvents that we take for the optimization experiment. And uh, it is very important that this solvent dissolves our substance very well. And this means that if our substances are very uh, non-polar, then also our solvent needs to be non-polar. Um, they, this, so this we can base on the like dissolves like um, principle. And it's also important that the interferences would be dissolved very poorly. So for example, if we are dealing with IR spectroscopy and we want to extract out some oils from a water sample to determine them with IR, then um, our interferences could come 
from um, one of the biggest interferences actually here is the sol is the solvent water itself. So we would need to remove water, which means that one very important pa uh, parameter here would be to choose a solvent that would dissolve water very, very little. So the water residues in the sample would be as minimal as possible. And it's also important that the phases would be very well separatable from one another. So this means that the solubility of the solvents would be very low. Otherwise, we might, we might get some emulsions or we have some other problems that would uh, make it very complicated to separate the two different layers, the water layer and the organic solvent layer. It's also good if the solvent densities would be different. Again, from the emulsion formation um, point of view, the sample, the, the layers just separate very much faster if we have different densities for the, um, for the solvents that we are using in our liquid-liquid extraction. The solvent should, of course, not react with the analytes or, yeah. Uh, so it should be inert, as well as it should not react with anything else that we are using later uh, in our uh, analysis. And of course, it's, it's the, the cheaper it is, because usually in the liquid-liquid extraction, we use multiple milliliters, as well as it should be non-toxic. So this is very important as well, both for the analyst as well as for the environment. However, sometimes in some specific applications, we also have to go with some solvents which are not so nice. So we need to take just extra care um, because sometimes it's not possible to substitute the solvents completely. This is especially is the case in case of IR where we our um, where our choice of solvent is usually very much limited with solvents that don't contain any CH bonds, for example. So in these cases, we might just need to be very, very careful. Uh, in, the extra, in the optimization of the extract is of the liquid liquid extraction procedure, we usually extract the, uh, optimize the extracting solvent. So we have a couple of choices that, which we have previously chosen based on then the solubility of the analyte. Maybe we also have some hints from the literature. Um, we also extract the amount, but sometimes we also optimize the pH and the ionic strength. So pH optimization is very, very important in cases our compounds are acids or bases. Uh, in cases in cases of acids, uh, we would, if we are dealing with extracting acids out from water phase, we would need to make the acids as low polarity as possible, which means that they should not be in the dissociated in the ionics and the anionic form. So this means, of course, that the pH would need to be as acidic as possible. While for bases, for example, nitrogen bases that can become protonated in the water phase, we need to do exactly the reverse. So this means that uh, we need to get them again into a neutral form, which for nitrogen bases, organic, uh, organic nitrogen bases happens at the higher pH. So depending on either we are interested in acids or bases, we would need to choose a diff different pH. If we are interested in both, maybe we need to combine two different extractions with a pH adjustment in between of these. Uh, neutral compounds are slightly simpler, so for them pH might not be so important or is not so important, but ionic strength is something that is important for both of them, uh, both all of these uh, types of compounds. Uh, ionic strength is very important because a kind of sorting out effect is known for mo mostly for water samples. So this means that when we increase the ionic strength, strength of them, water sample, that means by adding some inert salts to the water. Usually the solubility of most of the compounds in the organic solvent is increasing. This means that if, uh, if we want to increase the KD of our compounds to the organic solvent, then we could add some uh, inert salts. However, there are some exceptions where salting in can occur. So this means that uh, actually choosing the um, 
salt that we use is very important and testing is here highly highly needed in the optimization stage so that would actually have the salting out and not the salting in effect. But salting out effect is by far much more common. So what how are the problems in the liquid liquid extraction and why this is not so um, yeah, it, it, why it's losing its ground in the extraction landscape is that uh, fairly large solvent uh, volumes are required. Usually when we are having about 100 milliliters of a water sample, for example, then we would use uh, multiple times, multiple milliliters of the solvent to extract these water samples. It's also very work intensive, especially the old fashioned were separation funnel extraction, where we are putting the sample into the extraction funnel, adding the solvent, then shaking it manually, and then waiting for the layers to separate and then collecting the solvent phase from this, um, from the solvent, from the um, extraction funnel. And when we are repeating this multiple times, then the extraction can take an hour for one sample, which is very much when we keep in mind that um, a really large part of our analytical labs had uh, about 20 samples per day to be analyzed. And uh, this can be increased even further if the separation of the phases is very time consuming, which can happen if there are, is a possibility for, for emulsion forming or the densities of the solvents are very close. So the conventional apparatus to do this kind of separation is with a separation funnel where we use a periodic extraction. It's very cheap, but it's very labor intensive. So really we need to have someone who actually extracts um, these samples and then looks, oh, are the layers now uh, separated? Can I collect the uh, sample and then repeat this process? Also in kind of an old fashioned way, but still used for very large uh, extraction volumes is Soxlet extraction which is half continuous. So that means that we have a, um, here two, sol we have a, a, a solvent that is uh, evaporated from here. It evaporates, but here in the cooler, it condenses. Uh, the, so the extracting solvent would need to be uh, low, uh, higher in density so that it would drop down here through this uh, actual sample holder here. And then once the um, level of the liquid balance here, then the lower part of the solvent would flow down here. And of course, this is a uh, this is a continuous process, which means that the solvent is evaporating from here all of the time, and it's flowing through here. But once every once in a while, when the liquid niveaus here balance, it will flow back here. This is a good process because it can be left alone and being repeating and repeating and repeating for a longer period of time. So that's why it's it is for certain applications. It's still uh, quite much used, but it uses very large solvent volumes and it's not really very uh, environmentally friendly from this point of view. And that's why the re well, that's why the reason is that more and more extraction in a tube is used even for liquid liquid extraction. So what is an extraction in the tube for liquid liquid extraction? Uh, actually, the main method for liquid liquid extraction in the tube is something which is called catchers. And if you ever start working with um, some organic samples that undergo either chromatographic or mass spectrometry analysis, you will most probably hear and come across catcher sa sample preparation, which then is a liquid liquid extraction in a tube. Um, and this is it was originally developed to analyze um, pesticide residues from food samples. But today, catchers, so liquid liquid in a, liquid liquid extraction in a tube uh, methods have been developed also 
for pharmaceutical analysis, for pollutant analysis, all sorts of different um, compounds in different matrices. It's simply so nice, robust and fast method uh, to be used. So it's uh, something that analytical chemists really like, to like. And it's also very nicely semi-automatable, which allows doing multiple samples at once so that the large sample um, numbers can actually be analyzed within a fairly short period of time. And this liquid-liquid extraction is based on the fact that sometimes the KD values can be so high that even with just extracting once, much large majority of the compound actually extracts from the water phase to the extracting solvent. And uh, in these cases, we could put our sample, a, a liquid sample, into the Cube, put the extracting solvent on top, shake it virtuously, and then use a centrifugation to separate these layers again and just take an aliquot of this upper organic solvent layer for the analysis. Uh, this has also an advantage that we can do it in a fairly nice uh, with a fairly nice apparatus so that we could have multiple samples at once. We don't need to prepare one sample and then put the next sample in and do repeat it all over. We could have multiple tubes which are processed together essentially, which makes it time efficient. Uh, also, we can deal with much, much smaller sample volumes. We don't need to have 100 milliliters. Uh, but this again depends if the sample, if the analyte concentrations in the samples are sufficient to actually deal with this smaller, uh, to be able, able to actually still detect something if the sample volumes are smaller. And in the in case of the sketcher type of liquid liquid extraction in tube, we can also analyze samples with liquid liquid extraction, which are actually not liquid, but which are semi-liquid. This could be also, for example, plant parts uh, or some kind of samples which, when broken down somehow, for example, with a blender, they become almost liquid. So, for example, if you think of fruits and vegetables for which Gatchers was first uh, developed, then when we blend them, they become kind of smoothies, which are almost uh, liquid. And this is actually here a picture of a liquid liquid extraction of, a, um, of an apple, yeah, an apple that has been uh, first treated with a blender and then taken for this liquid liquid extraction. And this is uh, a very normal way to uh, analyze uh, um, pesticides and pesticide residues from different fruits and vegetables. Also, for example, samples that can be dissolved in small quantities of water, for example, honey analysis, or tissues, uh, biological tissue samples, which can also be similar, similarly um, uh, broken into a slurry with a, with, a, with a blender or in a homogenizer or something like that. So this can also be extracted in a tube with a liquid liquid extraction. So what we actually see here is uh, the layers are the organic solvent that is used for extracting, so the acetonitrile. Here in between the water phase and the acetonitrile phase is the, is the light uh, plant material that is lighter than water but heavier than acetonitrile, so it comes here on the, surf on the surface. And here we have the water phase that was then, which is then the water of the organic uh, of the original sample that was there, and quite on the uh, on the bottom you also see some salts. So these salts are used here to make the to increase the water the ionic strength in water so much that the acetonitrile would not dissolve in uh, in water anymore. Because in normal conditions, acetonitrile and water are very well miscible, as we know from the liquid chromatography analysis. The acetonitrile is a normal organic base to be used in, in liquid chromatography, which means that it has to be mixable with water. 
But if we add a lot of salt, then acetonitrile becomes so poorly uh, dissolved in water that we can actually observe two different layers here. So this is how the liquid liquid extraction in tube um, is, um, is conducted. Usually it can be followed by an additional cleaning. This means that we could um, add some kind of, uh, bring this uh, sample through a solvent that could absorb uh, some interfering compounds, or we could use a drying step if we want to inject it to gas chromatography, because in spite of this um, uh, salting out, uh, still water dissolves somewhat in acetonitrile, and the acetonitrile dissolves somewhat in water, so the uh, acetonitrile co sample collected from the top is actually not completely dry. So if we want to do GC analysis, for example, uh, we would need to uh, dry this uh, acetonitrile further. And we can do an additional cleanup or yes, to remove the water by some hygroscopic salts, for example. But the problem here is that the samples can't be concentrated very much. So this means that the concentration of the analyte uh, in the sample has to be still in such a range that we would not need an extensive concentration step. Uh, this is kind of the limitation of the liquid-liquid extraction in the tube. So when we have here an example of uh, how is the Gaetcher's liquid-liquid extraction of the vegetables uh, carried out, so the first step is to homogenize the sample in the blender. As a result, this, uh, these vegetables and fruits become kind of slurries that can be weighed. So we can weigh a specific amount of the sample. Then on top of it, we put our extracting solvent, which is acetonitrile. It also has a pH regulator, so acidic acid. And uh, we also add some salts. So uh, sodium acetate is added to, together with acetic acid to buffer the solution to have a specific pH to guarantee a reproducible extraction of the acidic and, and basic compounds. Uh, and uh, magnesium sulfate is then added to increase the ionic strength of the solution so that the acetonitrile would not dissolve in the uh, in the water, which is then the solvent of our sample. Then the extraction is facilitated by very rapidly shaking the tube. This can be done automatically or, or by hand for a few minutes. And then the layers are separated by centrifugation. Uh, from this sample, we take a milliliter or so for the next um, cleanup, which is done by an additional solvent. Um, and we will look at this kind of cleanup briefly also later. But the idea is that the solvent is added to this extract. So the extract is taken from the tube and put it into another tube. And here in this tube, we have another uh, solvent, which is then absorbing uh, compounds which could potentially interfere with our analysis. Uh, in case of uh, this food analysis, this could be, for example, coloring agents or other uh, organic uh, materials in our sample. And also we could add magnesium sulfate, to, uh, which is a hygroscopic, to remove water samples so that we could inject it to gas chromatography, for example. And we could follow this with a centrifugation. Uh, to precipitate down the magnesium sulfate and the uh, solvent material, and then take an aliquot of the sup uh, of the um, of the supernatant, so the liquid phase, and then take analyze this, for example, with chromatography, either liquid or gas chromatography. And here is, for example, how these extraction tubes would look for different samples, different food samples, when we want to determine pesticides from them. This is, for example, a paprika sample. This is a garlic sample, a tomato, a pear, orange, banana, and apple. And you see that in spite of, the, in spite of all these different samples, we see a kind of a uh, a nice separation of the acetonitrile and the water layer. Uh, 
You also see that depending on the sample, the uh, acetonitrile uh, layers look different. So these are before the purification with the additional sorbent. And one of the purposes of the sorbent is then to remove these interfering coloring compounds that could potentially interfere with our uh, further analysis. Uh, in the next video, we are going to look at how solid phase extraction can be done to also purify our samples, which are liquid samples.